I'm Sandy Metz. Thanks for coming. I am a woman of a certain age. And what that means is that for about the first 35 years of my working life, I had a day job where I went to my desk and wrote code. That's what I did for a living. And then sort of by accident, I wrote this book. Oh, sorry. I changed my slides right before I came in here, but they weren't on the USB stick. <laughs> no, 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 it's not your fault. I'm so grateful. I wrote a book whose picture I cannot show you because it's on another slide deck uh, called Practical Object-Oriented Design in Ruby that, amazingly enough, people read. And then I started getting invited to speak at conferences, and then I was traveling, and then I couldn't really keep my day job. And so I didn't have a way to make a living, and folks started asking me to teach. And that became my job. And so now when I get paid, I get paid for teaching short courses in object-oriented design. And, and it's a cool thing, right? At this sort of advanced stage of my life right now, what I do is I think about code. I think about how to write code. I think about what would make a good application. And so I'm a little bit, it's not that I don't have pressure, but I have a different kind of pressure than I used to have when I wrote code every day. Uh, I tr I'm trying to figure out what it would mean to write uh, apps that made us happy. And as I started going places teaching, now instead of seeing just uh, tunnel vision like the apps I was working on, I go 10 or 12 or 15 places a year and spend three plus days with some team looking at their app. And so I get this uh, narrow slice of lots of different apps instead of a deep slice into one app. And what I started noticing after a while, I started becoming aware of a pattern of failure in those applications. And at first I thought maybe it was just me, right? Because nobody calls me when things are going well, <laughs> right? It could be some self-selecting thing. And so I started asking friends of mine about this problem that I thought I was understanding. Like, do, you, do your apps have this problem? And it turns out everyone I ask about it says, oh, yeah, our, our code looks like that. And so I've decided that it's almost universal, this kind of failure in our object-oriented applications. And I just hate it. It just breaks my heart that we're all having this problem because now that I've had a moment to think, it seems to me as if it would be easy to do better and we could make our lives a lot um, pleasant and more straightforward if we could just uh, acknowledge and resolve this problem. So today, the talk is about the problem. I'm going to explain it to you. I think you have it too. I'm going to show you some code where I illustrate the problem. I'm going to, uh, in the part three of the talk, so this is the first two parts. In part three, I'm going to explain what I think the solution is. And then in the final part, part four, I'm going to take the code we wrote that illustrates the problem and transform it to solve the problem. All right? A little lesson, an entire lesson in OO. And so we're going to start out talking about the problem in words. Oh, stand by just for a minute. So is it, can I turn the lights down at all? Is it possible? I have a lot of contrast on my slides, and yet they're so pitifully washed out. I hear, I'm begging. We'll see. We'll see if it, we'll see if it works. Yeah, am I allowed to? Why not? Right? It's for the video guys, right? They need some light in here in order to, to get videotaping. But even if you could just turn some down, like, right in the front. Nobody needs to see me on the video. They would like it if the slide. Oh, yeah. There we go. Thank you, Zach. Yes. Yay. Okay, so part one, how it all goes wrong. I'm going to talk about four different things in this part. There are apparently different and unrelated ideas about software, but I think they are related and they, taken together, they explain the problem I'm seeing. The first one is this idea of Martin Fowler's. It's called the design stamina hypothesis. He illustrates it with this uh, like graph plot. Uh, on it, you can see that the, on the vertical axis is cumulative functionality, how much you get done. On the horizontal axis is time passing. Um, you, so higher numbers up here mean you got more done. Over here, more time has passed. He put two lines on this graph in the blog post he wrote about this. One is how much you get done over time if you don't do design. And the other is how much you get done if you do do design. And what, you'll, what you see is that here, this part, is the over design line. This says if you do design too early, you won't get as much done as you otherwise could. You don't know enough to do design. You shouldn't be putting a lot of effort into design here. However, this part up here 
is the under design line. It says lead in your project. Once you have a lot of code and you understand what your application is about, if you don't do enough design, your velocity will gradually slow. And so if he's right, really what we want to do is we want to be here early on, and then we want to switch horses and start doing design at this inflection point. Now, the problem is, this, this all looks really, it's great in theory, but the truth is, in real life, you have no idea that you're crossing that line. And this, this is exacerbated by Agile. I am not complaining about Agile. I love Agile, but I'm a woman of a certain age. I wrote Waterfall for many, many years where we had people who were in charge of having the, a big picture about the code base. And now that we reward people for how quickly they can take something off the backlog and get it done, it is common to go in shops and have no one who has a big picture about the code. And you get in situations where they wake up one day and they're out here and velocity is slowed to zero. So that's the design stamina hypothesis. Here's idea number two. It's about the difference between procedures, procedural code, and OO. It's another space like this to illustrate the idea. Here, uh, how hard it is to change parts is on the vertical axis. How easy it is to understand the whole is on the horizontal axis. A procedure, a simple procedure would go down here. It's easy to understand and easy to change. By simple procedure, I mean not very many lines of code and no conditionals. The reason that people, the reason that simple procedures are attractive to us is because OO, the, the OO that you would use to replace a simple procedure is harder. OO relies on objects, which rely on messages. Messages add levels of indirection. Indirection makes code harder to understand. If you have a problem that can be solved with a simple procedure, you should write that procedure. It is the easiest way to write code. The problem, however, with simple procedures is that they don't scale. As time passes and more and more function gets added, they get big and they accumulate conditionals. And so they, they end up way up there on the uh, top right-hand corner of this chart. And so then you have these huge piles of code that are hard to understand and difficult to change. The only thing worse than a complex procedure is bad OO. All right? <laughs> This is why people complain about, oh, what happens is they take those complex procedures that are control and they, they wrap them in something I call FOO, <laughs> right? They're just trying to hide the procedure and they don't really understand the underlying abstractions. And so they just take what is a messy procedure and they add levels of indirection to punish the maintainers. <laughs> All right? This, so that hurts, All right? Okay, so that's the second idea, the difference between procedures and OO. The third idea is one by a guy named Michael Feathers. He wrote a blog post a number of years ago that contained this, uh, another plot space. Here, uh, complexity is on the vertical axis, things that are simpler at the bottom, highly complex code is at the top. Churn, which is just a measure of, you could count churn by counting the number of commits of a file. It's how often you change a file. So if something never changed, it would be over here. If something changed a lot, it would be over here. Um, so you can take any piece of code in your system and p give it a churn number and a complexity number and then plot it in this space. In a well-designed system, if you do that, what you should see is the points should cluster around a curve like this green line that I've added. All right? What this says, if your application looks like that, what it says is that things that are really, you have some really complex things, but they don't change very much, and that the code that you change a lot is really simple. And that's how your app should look. Um, that is what hurts. Highly complex code that changes all the time. This is code that's very hard for us to manage. All right, one last idea here in part one. The only things that really matter to us are the things that are, that are having a, the things that have a problem are the code that really matters to us. Here are some, this is a page from Code Climate. Uh, in case you're not familiar with it, Code Climate is a business that does static analysis of applications. And so they, they you know, slurp in all your source code, run it through a bunch of statistics, and one of the things they produce is a graph that looks like this. They call it churn versus quality, but you can think of this as Michael Feather's churn versus complexity chart. Um, I went to, and they, uh, Code Climate does open source projects for free. So I went and looked around on GitHub and tried to find three projects of increasing quality to, and then to look at their turn versus complexity chart. They give, an, they give projects an overall score that's a letter grade, which they call it a GPA, so four would be an A. Uh, this is Angular. 
it's a low C. Notice that the you kind of the points kind of fit around that curve, but look at that. All right, here's another one. This is a discourse. They get this is a good solid C plus. This is a pretty good score, right? In real life, it's hard to do much better than this for a big project. That looks pretty nice, but what is that? <laughs> All right, and here we go, uh, GitLab. Here we go again. This is a really good score. This is almost a B, which you rarely, again, you rarely see this in real life, right? Uh, the pressures of production, the pressures of real work often reduce code quality. That looks pretty good, but there you go. All right, now, this pattern is so pervasive that I'll bet if I ask you what class is this in your app that you can name it. That's right. <laughs> you know what it is. All right? So this is the thing that convinced me that it was not just places I was going. It's not just places that call me. Everyone has this problem. And, oh, and I was super interested in trying to figure out why and what we could do about it. Um, I've given this a name. I call that the Death Star anti-pattern. <laughs> And I can tell you something about sight unseen. I can tell you about the, the class or classes in your app that are in that top right-hand corner. Those classes have these characteristics. They're bigger than average. They're full of conditionals. They don't have a complete test suite. Uh, to change them is to break them. Nobody wants to work on them. And they're the most important classes in your domain. Nailed it. <laughs> this is a universal truth. So first of all, don't feel bad about it, right? It, this happens to everybody. And really, the point of this talk is to, is to teach you how to fix this, to, to describe how it happened, and to teach you how to fix it. All right, so you started out. So we started, if you, if you think about uh, every, when you st your apps, Right? You started out basically following the design stamina hypothesis. You just throw code at the wall. Most of us do that, right? We throw code at the wall until we can sort of get enough code in there to figure out what's going on. And then what happens is that means we start out writing procedures. And that as, as, things, as time passes, the, per, the code that's important to your app changes more than the code that's not. Right? So you write a bunch of simple procedures. Some of the change rate of important things is, is higher than the rate of change of unimportant things. And so you end up churning. The stuff that matters to you churns more. And what that means is by the time you figure out that you've crossed the churn versus complexity line, the code that doesn't matter much to you is kind of complicated, but not so complicated that you can't fix it. The code that really matters to you is so out of control that it defeats your attempts to turn it into OO. That's why user sucks. It went too long. And there's a point of complexity at which uh, most humans can't do a refactoring that turns those objects into OO. And that's how we got the way we are. I have an illustration. Imagine you're writing a book. Imagine that you're, uh, it's, a book about, it's a book that involves programming. And you're going to slurp in source code. So you have some files that have text. And then there's some kind of markup that lets you point to a file on disks of source code. Because you have to separate the source code, right? You have to have full examples of code that you can run tests on. So I need to dynamically pull source code into the book. I could just read. This is the Ruby code. All the examples are in Ruby. Don't worry. Just read. It just reads like English, right? So even if you don't know Ruby, you won't have any trouble following this. So it could be that I just want to read code off files on disk. This line of Ruby code will read a file, turn, uh, turn it into an array of strings for every line. And that works for about 10 minutes. <laughs> right? And then you need a change. It turns out that it's not enough to read code off disk. Really, it would be nice if you could pull things out of get tags. Like, really, I need version control to pull this code in. But I also still want to sometimes read things off disk. So now I have, this, now I have a conditional. That's what just happened here. And it's not so hard. Again, don't worry if you don't know the Ruby code. This would be a little, that's a little method. The back tick is how I issue a command. I can use the, basically the get show command. And I would probably write a little class. So this is a little Ruby class that will go look up get, look up code at some get tag and read it. All right. And so now that I have, if I make this class, then of course I want both things. I either need to read from a file or, so now I have a conditional, which I, uh, execute based on whether or not you pass me a git command. And, if, and once it gets this bad, I'll probably make a little class for it. So I have a little listing class. At now, but, and it's, 
I don't know, it's ugly, but it fits, it's a 40-point font, and it fits on the slide, right? So, I mean, probably it doesn't matter, right? So that's a, that's a mistake. That was fixed in the other USB, no, it was my fault. Okay, so, so then, so that works for a while, and then it turns out that, like, you ha your listing files have to be full and complete so you can run the tests on them. But really, every time you refer to some listing in the book, you don't want the whole file. You might want just a little snippet of code. So you have to have some way, some, some markup like this. This is kind of like the markup that lets you print certain pages out of a listing, right? I want to be able to specify what line numbers from that listing go in the book, something like this. So now here's the first big lesson, right? Enemy, that, that easy and simple are not the same thing. Rich Hickey has a great talk about this, right? What was easy is what I did to begin with. And if I do more of that, that seems easy, but the result will not be simple. Doing, doubling down on what worked to begin with is going to eventually fail me. And so here, what people are going to do when they come in here is they're just going to do more of what you've done. So now I'm just going to pass in line numbers, save them, and then this thing. So now I need to put a new conditional right there. And already... I feel bad about that, right? Don't you feel bad about that? You don't want me to do it. So what we're going to do is hide some of the complexity. I'm going to pretend it's not there. So it's like, I'll just take that and make a method. And look, doesn't that look better? <laughs> <laughs> and then if I did that, we're going to do this, right? We're going to make a method for that. And then now it's, it's like, oh. Now it somehow feels OK. Like, be careful. This is how it happens. And so I have to save that in a temporary variable. And then I'm going to do a thing. And this is super interesting right here. It looks like there's one exception, not two the way this code is written. Uh, that's going to come back later. And so this, uh, of course, I had to write a new method. And here, I'm really sorry. OK, so I have to break on commas, have to figure out like what that's about. And I don't know about you, but every time I write code that has to do something like that, it looks like this. And I, I don't even understand what it does like five minutes later. right? <laughs> don't even try to figure out what that does. It does work. It has tests. And so, but, but. <laughs> Just don't look, right? Like, if it never changes, maybe still it's OK. But then, of course, the next thing that happens is I need another change in it, right? Because when you start dropping out lines of code, it's really hard for the reader of your book to know what's missing. You have to give them a hint that a piece went away in that. So I need some sort of syntax that would say, uh, put a comment line that's preceded by four spaces, or put a comment that's preceded by six spaces, right? I need some way to dynamically add that little comment dot, dot, dot with an ellipsis there so that you can tell that code is missing. And so now I just, I need that. I just told you that I didn't want to. <laughs> but it's, I can really make this change without, without refiguring out what that does, right? I, I know it goes right here. <laughs> And so I, just, I can just parse for that pound sign and put another conditional in there. Don't worry, but you can sort of see, right? I'm looking for the pound sign and doing that. I like that. That's a cool thing about Ruby. I, can, I love Ruby. Sorry. I'm sure your languages are great, too. <laughs> so, so OK, so that works. And then, of course, now instantly I need another change. So unaccountably, what happens is the book is a success. People are buying it and reading it, and they want it because I love Ruby, all the, all the examples are in Ruby right now, uh, people want it in other languages. And it turns out, amazingly enough, I know you'll be stunned to hear this, um, there is not universal agreement about how many spaces replaces a tab. <laughs> I thought we agreed that the rule was two. <laughs> right? Two. But I'm looking at you, Python. Everybody, does, <laughs> everybody doesn't agree with this. So... So it turns out if you're reaching in deep into a file and grabbing a little block of code that's down in it, it can be way over on the right-hand side of the page of the book. And so we need some way to optionally take that block of code and push it back to the left. So I guess I'll just inject another <laughs> argument. i got to remember that. And then, well, I, I, yeah, i got to put a new <laughs> conditional right there, which means i got to sort of make this whole thing be like a whole conditional. And, I, the, and then I have to put a new thing down here. And... I wrote this method, and this one was so bad that I at least wrote a bunch of different methods that I don't understand. <laughs> okay, so, so that all works. All right, so, so let's, let me remind you of what just happened. All right, first, I, initially I just wrote a file, and then I wanted these two things. And so we wrote this code. 
uh, in a minute you're not going to be able to read it. Don't worry. I just want you to see the shape of it. All right? There's uh, 20 line, 29 lines, and it had two execution paths. The next change was we either wanted all of the code or just some of the lines of code. That took a few more lines, and it doubled the number of execution paths. And then we made another change where we wanted uh, a line of code or a comment. And that only added five lines of code, but the execution paths doubled again. It went from four to eight. And then to get justification, it was a bunch more lines of code. And now I have 16 execution paths. Right. It took me three minutes. It took me three minutes to show you code. That to, I wrote a Death Star here in three minutes. All right. That's how it happens. You just keep doing the same procedural stuff over and over and over again. And so here, this is the next big rule here, right? What initially made you succeed will eventually doom you to failure. You cannot keep. You cannot double down on your coping strategy when it turns out that you've crossed the inflection point, this is the time when we need to do a better thing. This code is hard. It's not, I, don't, I don't have a test for every one of those 16 execution branches because I just got tired of it. All right? And I know you did too. Your code looks the same way. All right? If anybody went in there and touched it, I promise you they would break it. Probably me. And I wrote it. This is real code for a real project. Right? Um, so, having completely depressed you, Let's talk about doorknobs. <laughs> this is a doorknob. It, it offers, there's a, there's a word, there's a super interesting word called affordances. It's a made-up word, all right? Uh, things offer affordances, physical things in the real world. world. Doorknob, this round doorknob, these are the affordances it offers. You can grasp it, you can rotate it, and you can use it to push or pull on the door. And you can tell that it affords those things by looking at it. Um, it doesn't give you a cue about which of push or pull works. Notice that. And you, we've all had the experience of, like, you don't look at the hinge side, so you, like, try to you crash into the door because it didn't open when you thought. There's, a, there's another. This is another. I have these at my house at home. These are, this is a replacement for the first doorknob you saw. Um, this is a lever. It was, they originally created as an accessibility thing. You can use them if you don't have hands or if your hands are full. Um, I can tell you they're super, they're super useful, right? You can come up to that door with your both hands full, press down with your elbow, and knock the door open with your hip, right? It totally works. Now, it still doesn't help you with knowing whether to push or pull on it, but it offers a different kind of affordances, and it's very obvious how to use it just by looking at it. This solves uh, the, la the failure of, the, it's a design failure of affordances that they've overcome by giving you written directions. That's why it says pull, because you can't tell whether you should pull or not. Here's another set. I have three more here. These, none of these la none of these solve the latching unlatching problem. They're just about whether you push or pull. You can look at this and tell that you should pull. It affords pulling, not pushing. This one is offensive. <laughs> Because, duh, what would you do but pull on it? Now, having said that, I recently taught a course in a, a place in New York where we were in a fishbowl conference room that had a glass door. And in a fit of symmetry, whoever had bought the hardware for the place put this shape on both sides of the door. And so people crashed into the door the whole time I was there. And on one side, they had a little push sign, a very elegant, small push sign on the, on the opposite side of the door. It said pull right there. This is really what you expect to have on the opposite of both of the, the other ones, right? That's the plate that tells you you push the door open. All right. So affordances, programming languages offer affordances, just like real things in the real world. And OO offers very specific affordances. Now, I'm talking now about OO, not about functional programming, not about procedural programming, not about whatever other harebrained style of programming there might be out there. This, I'm, I'm going to give you a list, and then I'm going to go through them one by one. All right? This is what OO affords. Anthropomorphic, polymorphic, loosely coupled, role-playing, factory-created, message-sending objects. This is OO. All right? Here's what those things mean. Anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism is... Uh, it's, it's where we attribute human qualities to non-human things, right? I can't tell 
whether this thing is excited or afraid. <laughs> but it seems very human to me. OO is the same way, right? We are not writing dry, sterile mathematical procedures. I think the functional people are more in that camp, right? What I'm doing is creating a play. I'm making a world where objects have uh, desires and volition, right? They, they have intention, and I use them that way. That's what OO wants you to do. And that you, that gra getting a hold of that feeling about OO is, a, is the thing you can do that will make your applications better. So that's uh, anthropomorphism. Polymorphism. Polymorphism is the, uh, have its multi, uh, many forms is what the word means. We stole it from biology. This is a monarch butterfly. This is a viceroy butterfly. There they are side by side. Monarchs taste bad. Viceroys taste good, but they look like monarchs. All right, so this is a kind of polymorphism they call mimicry in the biology world. Uh, we've stolen that, we've borrowed, I should say, that term to, to, to describe the quality of uh, having many objects, many objects of different types that respond to the same messages. They can polymorphically conform to the same API. That, that has many, um, many, things, many good things happen when objects polymorphically conform to the same API. It means I don't need to know what kind of thing I'm talking to in order to know how to converse with it. Coupling. We want loose coupling. In, in this situation, I, I now have a dog, so I'm one of those people. This is not my dog, but I am tempted to put pictures of my dog in slideshows at talks. Um, this dog, there's a person holding that blue thing. You can tell that the person is holding it and the dog is holding it, but they could both let it go. All right? They're making use of that object, but you could easily uh, substitute any one of the three things. You could substitute a different person, you could substitute a different dog, or they could both let go and you could substitute a different object. All right? uh, tight coupling would mean you could do none of those things. Only that person could use that toy with that dog. We, pr we much prefer loose coupling. It's what gives us changeability across some boundary or seam. Uh, role playing. Object, we think of objects not as their types, but as players of roles. Now, role playing is just a way to, it's an anthropomorphic way to say polymorphic. So I've, this is really a repeat of polymorphism, but I like role playing better because, frankly, polymorphism is a word that most people don't really understand, and we just used to intimidate one another. <laughs> Right? It's a little fuzzy. What it took me a long time to really get a handle on what polymorphism was. But if you can think about objects as playing roles, what I want is a bunch of different objects that conform to the same API. They play a role. I care about the role that they have, not the type that they are. Uh, in this situation, as far as the server's concerned, they are all receivers. You could substitute another receiver of serve in here, and it would just work. It doesn't mean they're all the same thing. They're not. Clearly, there's, there's some allowable variability on the shoe front. <laughs> but it doesn't matter in terms of their, the, their, their, the role they're playing as a receiver of serve. All right, factory created. Once you start uh, interacting with, poly, with objects that polymorphically play roles, someone has to pick the right one. And that happens in factories. It's, it, the, Factories hide conditionals. We're trying to push them away back into uh, factories. Now, I'm not talking about this kind of factory. I'm talking about this kind of factory. Little, lightweight, simple things that we all understand. Factories are not big, harebrained patterns that, like, don't even look in the pattern books for factory. What we're trying to do is uh, separate the logic that chooses the object from the, lo from the logic that interacts with the object that's chosen. Factories choose objects. You, your other things, interact with whatever objects that got chosen. And message sending. Alan Kay, the guy who invented OO, uh, has stated that he, sometimes he wishes he'd called it message-oriented message software instead of object-oriented software. Because really, the most important thing about OO is that I communicate with, we have objects because we send messages, not the opposite. Right? We don't send messages because we have objects. It's the message sending that, cause, that causes us to need objects. And so what message sending does is it creates a seam, a level of interaction, that allows me to be ignorant of your implementation. I'm striving to know nothing on my side so that you can change independently of me. So there you go. That's OO. And it's not hard to do 
once you get this deeply embedded in your mind. Let's go ahead, let's practice before I let you go. Let's fix the code that I wrote in part two. Remember that, right, you have as many execution branches as you have. It's the Cartesian product of the branches of the conditionals. That's why you don't have good enough tests. But what also that means is that the early, fixing one cuts them in half, right? The big wins are the early ones. And so let's fix the first one here. I'm going to fix this one. And so now I have a favorite rant. I have a favorite rant about, oh, you know, there's, there are people who object to the idea of dependency injection. They're like, oh, you know, it's terrible. I won't know the thing. It'll be bad. Something will happen. I don't know. But here's the thing I say. That is a dependency, and someone injected it. <laughs> like people, I, I hear people complain about dependency injection who are, who are dealing with injected dependencies. That, if you know enough to do that, what I want is for you to inject a smarter thing. And let's make that smarter thing, right? First, I have to decide. I'm going to make a. I'm going to define a role and make objects that polymorphically play it. And the first thing you have to do here—it's a problem of naming and abstractions. What is it? What is this role? I finally, I went, I went around and around because names are hard. I finally decided this was the source. All right, so I'm going to make, I have to pick an API. All the players of the source role have to polymorphically implement the same message. So I can just talk to them by sending them a message. I'm gonna, the API is going to be lines. And so everything in this big circle I can put as many players of the role as I want in there. Right now I have two. The way I would write them is I would polymorphically implement lines. And here, all you have to do is get the, the code out of one of the branches of the conditional and the code out of the other. That's all there is to it. I've made two new objects. Now when I do this, oh, sorry. This is what happens when I walk away from my, when I walk away from the speaker notes. Um, here, I'm going to go back and say that again. When you have a conditional you're in, where you're providing two kinds of behavior, the, the, the OO solution to that is to isolate the things you want to vary and make objects for each of them. All right? So that's what we're always looking. When you see a need for variance in your code, what, what you, your first instinct, your reaction, is that you want to suck it out and make objects for it so you can plug in a, a role player that supplies just that variation. Um, here, the, the part I've highlighted in red is the amount of code in here dealing with source. All of it can go away. Instead of injecting the arguments that let me choose, I can just inject a source. And then here, this goes away and becomes that. I can just ask the source for its lines. Now, that cut the, the number of execution paths in this, in this code in half. Now, and the conditional is gone. And I am well aware that you are probably wondering where it went. <laughs> and I will get back to that, I promise you. But let's, let's leave that for now. Really, what you can think of is here, it's clear that somebody before me has the conditional, right? It had to happen before I got here. I'm trying to push conditionals back in the stack. And if I can push them back far enough, there ought to be, I ought to be able to put them in one place. And that's always our goal here. All right, so let's just move on here. I mean, the next one looks almost just like what we just did. What's the name of this? This is the hard part of OO. It's easy to just keep on adding more conditions. The hard part is figuring out what the role is and giving it a name. I called this subset. Now, it, the interesting thing here, notice this one. Let's go, I'm going to make it. Uh, I just want to inject a smarter thing right there. I'm going to call the API lines again. Now, notice the everything subset, what does it look like, right? This can be super hard for people. I, I, okay, I have seven minutes left. This can be super hard for people to get, this whole notion of everything. You have to have this or else you're doomed to the conditional. You have to be able to treat them all the same. And I submit to you that the subset of everything is as legitimate a subset as any other subset. Like, I don't know what it does. I just get somebody passes me a subset and I ask it. If you have that, then you can forget this conditional. We'll come back to that. It's got to polymorphically conform to the API. All of that is about subsetting. I can just inject a subsetter, talk to it, and then, of course, I can sort of compose these functionally. 
and that takes my execution passage down to four. Right? Dependency injection. We love dependency injection, but you have to inject smart things. Don't inject things and supply behavior for them. Push that out back in the stack. I'm going to do this one just because it's like the ones we just saw, even though it was the fourth change we made. It's for a justifier. I'm going to call it justify, but I don't know, perilously echoey. This has a none justifier just like we had an everything subset. Right? This is a key O concept. You have to have that one or else you're doomed to the conditional somewhere. But once you do that, you can just plug a justifier in, same thing, boom, looks like that. Now, I promise you the conditionals, we're almost done. I promise you a look at the conditionals. There's still a conditional buried down here. It's this one that's stuck down in that subsetter. Now, it, this is interesting because I'm not actually injecting a dependency here. Like, I don't know spec ex until I iterate over this collection. So it's not like someone else can pass me the right object. I have to do it here. That doesn't keep you from, like, I call it clump. I'm going to use lines again, so there's going to be a comment one or a line number one. Here, uh, this is just the code that I had there. They each need some data, so I arrange the code a little bit differently here before so they can, they can inherit something that has those, those attributes. Um, I still don't have any good way to get it in here, but let's take a half step here. I'll just replace the bodies of the true and the false branch with uh, explicit calls to those new classes. All right, this is better, but it's still not right. It's polymorphic for sure, because I'm calling lines on both one. It's, uh, those objects both clearly play this role, but the rule about how to choose is, is buried down in this method, which means I'm tightly coupled. And I want to be loosely coupled here. In order to, many things could change that would break this code. Like if they change how specs got passed, if new classes got created. This is like buried deep in the body of some class I have, and it has many dependencies to things I don't own. Um, what, I, what you need here is a factory, and the factory needs to contain this conditional. This is what factories look like. I'm just going to grab that conditional and stick it over in that class I just created, the clump class. Don't worry about it. Really, I made a for method here that picks the class. And once I have a factory, I can put a little utility method on there that calls for and then ask whatever comes back for its lines. Uh, if you do this, then over here, you can replace that body of code with a very generic call to clump. You can just ask for its lines and pass the arguments, and it'll give you back the right thing. All right, so we started out with this, which was really this one. The O version had many more parts. There were two sources, two subsets, two clumps, two justifiers in the listing class, and then some factories. There was, um, if you ignore the factories for a minute, this whole body of code, there's 134 lines of code here now, there's, but every, every, there's not, everything in here has only one execution path. If you ignore the factories, there's no conditional in any of this code. There are now nine classes instead of one, but the biggest class has 18 lines of code. Now, the factories are a little more complicated because each of them contains some kind of conditional, but I don't care, right? It hides them. They should be in one place. This is the only place in your application that knows how to pick the right class to go with whatever data that you have, and th there's no avoiding this one. Somebody has to know and somebody has to pick. What you want to do is pick in one place. This class that was originally really complicated now looks like this. And its only responsibility is to arrange. It's to arrange the collaboration of objects with, with, with which it is injected. It used to know how to choose what behavior, and now it knows how to send a message to the role-playing object that it gets given. Um, there are many parts here, and it's, it's easier to understand. It's, it, you can make a new part. You can easily change any part. It is harder to understand the operation of the whole. That's OO. It's not free. It's just if you have this problem, OO is the solution for it, not procedures. Um, th I believe this code is better. And the last thing I'm going to say before I finish today is that sometimes I show this to people. I, th when I go and teach, I show code like this to people, and they say, oh, we can't do that because now I can't tell what anything does. And I have my snarky self, the secret snarky Sandy thinks, well, yeah, <laughs> like, duh, that's the whole purpose. But, but really, like, my more generous, in my more generous heart, I know why they're saying that. And you might be saying it, or you might have people in your shop that say it. 
right? People who say, I can't write code like this because now I can't tell what things do. They're living in a world full of o faux o. They're dealing with untrustworthy objects that don't play their roles. And their lived experience is that you cannot collaborate with an object unless you know all the stuff that it does because they're not trustworthy. Right? And so when people tell you, I can't write code like this, let's be understanding about what their problem is. Right? They're not wrong. They're just suffering because they don't really have OO. And if, if the objects that they were collaborating with polymorphically played the roles correctly, this would just work, and you don't need to know what's there. So there you go. Oh, oh, that's your problem. Go fix your Death Stars. <laughs> Thanks.